Welcome to the next stop on the tour. We're here at the Heinz House in downtown Dandridge in the middle of the National Historic District. This building was constructed in 1845 by Shadrach Inman for his daughter Elizabeth when she was getting married to William Bradford. And Shadrach, who was living at the time over here at the end, built him this wonderful two-story frame home. One of the architectural features I like to point out on this house is this wonderful cut limestone foundation. Look at this foundation along this house. We have original windows, original foundation. There's not a settlement crack or, or any type of issue with this foundation, and it has not changed since 1845 when it was built. And this is a period before the construction techniques we have today where you dig down below the frost line and put a footer in. These buildings were built to stay, and, test, and they stood the test of time. I'd like to take you inside next and tell you a little bit about the period of the Battle of Dandridge. Welcome to the next stop on the tour. We are here today at the Heinz House in the historic district of Dandridge. And one of the interesting stories I'd like to share with you about the Heinz House, it has to do with the period of the Battle of Dandridge during the American Civil War. Um, the Battle of Dandridge took place uh, in January of 1864. Longstreet had come off of a major victory down in Chickamauga Longstreet believed that control of Tennessee was the key to victory in the Civil War. The railroad systems that were moving north and south came through East Tennessee, and he got permission to come into East Tennessee and try to secure it and keep it under Confederate control. Well, the Union already had control of Knoxville and the railroad station that passed through Knoxville, so Longstreet's army had to come down through uh, North Carolina and take the rail system there through South Carolina into Georgia and come up into Chattanooga to try to get into East Tennessee. At that point he ran into Braxton Bragg down there in his army and they, uh, they, they won a big victory over the Union at the Battle of Chickamauga. So he was ordered to lay siege to Knoxville. Well the siege of Knoxville failed. Uh, the coldest winter in record was upon East Tennessee. At the end of December in 1863, we hit 29 degrees below zero. And these were ill-equipped troops. You can imagine, with that kind of cold, the troops mainly were interested in survival. They were looking for heat. They were looking for food, uh, you know, for the horses and for the men. They were just looking to survive during that period. Longstreet was ordered after the failed siege of Knoxville to, lay, to winter over in the valley of East Tennessee. So he's marched his troops east into Jefferson County and headquartered in places called Russellville today, but that was Jefferson County up until 1870 when Haverland County was formed. So his army of 20,000 troops were wintering over here in Jefferson County and they were in search of food where they found a food source was along the French Broad River from Dandridge all the way up to Newport. The corn was still standing on the river bottoms. There was enough corn to feed his army and all of his horses uh, for that winter and to survive this bitter cold. So they were foraging all the corn on the river bottoms uh, around the Dandridge area, actually, actually about uh, five miles east of here at Hayes Ferry, and uh, the Union caught wind of what was going on, and the Union Army uh, decided that uh, they would come from Knoxville, that they wanted to secure the food source for their army. And they came up here and occupied Dandridge uh, on January the 15th of 1864. Longstreet was having nothing to do with it, so he brought his troops east. They met between Dandridge and Hayes Ferry, um, and they skirmished for two days, hilltop to hilltop. Neither army made much headway. Um, the uh, Union Army was a little bit nervous. They were down in this low area of Dandridge. Um, there was some, actually, the, the, a thaw had started by then. There was a little bit of rain. The roads were turning to mud. And they knew that if they got routed out of Dandridge, that it was going to be slow go trying to pull their, their cannons and their supplies and all the troops across these muddy roads. So they decided to employ one of their favorite defense tactics during the Civil War and that is to build a temporary bridge across the river, which they can cross and destroy behind them and put the river between them and the other army. So uh, on the morning of January the 16th, 1864, they sent General Park from this building here, and his uh, he, he was uh, uh, co the commanding officer with General Park. They had, Park sent Sheridan uh, down to the river bottoms over here on the French Bar River below Danvers to pick a spot to build the pontoon bridge. Well, it was a foggy, foggy January winter morning. You couldn't even see the other side of the river. The fog was, the, the river was just covered with this cloud. 
every once in a while a whiff of wind would lift the clouds up and the fog would lift and they could maybe catch a glimpse of the other side of the river. And they had to pick their, their, their best spot to build their bridge and of course they would pick one of the closest spots, wouldn't they? They built their pontoon bridge, they sent a rider across to test it and he disappeared off into the fog for a little while. When he came back, he was shaking his head like this. Oh my goodness, he had reported to his commanding officer. They built their, their uh, pontoon bridge onto a giant island, onto Fane Island. Another half of the river lay on the other side of the island. They didn't have the supplies or the time to build a second bridge, so he rode back into this very house where his commanding officer, General Park, was headquartered and uh, uh, had to report the failed pontoon bridge attempt. So the officers met probably in this very parlor here where, we're, where we are today and had to decide what's their next move. And they decided that they would slip out of night, under cover of night that night and leave Danbridge behind. They built up their campfires all east of town and up on the hill above town where all the soldiers were camped uh, in an effort to, to uh, convince the Confederate Army, uh, Longstreet's Army, that they were staying overnight. So they slipped out under cover of night with the fires burning. And in the morning when Longstreet rode into town, he found it deserted. The Union Army was gone. And the lady of the house who lived here, uh, she was a Confederate supporter. She was glad to be rid of those Union officers who had been over, uh, staying with her overnight. She invited Longstreet and his officers into this parlor here in the Hines house and uh, uh, greeted them here and uh, she handed them a little gift. Uh, well, guess what? In their haste, General Granger had left behind a bottle of Union brandy here at the house. And the lady of the house handed to Longstreet and said, here, this is for you. Uh, they decided that the occasion called for a sentiment or a toast. And uh, uh, one of the other officers decided that he would offer a toast with the Union brandy to the Union army who had left town. And I believe the toast went something like this. They toasted the, uh, they hoisted the, the, the brandy and said, General Granger, may his shadow never grow shorter. And that's a classic toast of the early days. It has to do with the fact that he ran with his tail between his legs. He didn't stand and fight, but he ran. And so anyway, that, that toast probably took place right here. And uh, the, the big battle never occurred. There was 24,000 I mean, Union troops in Dandridge, 20,000 Confederate troops in Dandridge. If it had been a major battle, you'd read about it in every, every Civil War book written. But basically, because of the weather and the circumstances, it was a series of skirmishes, and the Confederate took the day.